Okay, Emmett, shall we? Sure. All right, thank you all for coming. My name is uh, Emmett McMullen, and I'm a library technical assistant at the New Haven Free Public Library. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Democracy in America, a program made in partnership between the New Haven Free Public Library and Yale Public Humanities. This glorious midday, we welcome Professor Matthew Fry Jacobson and Professor Laura Baraklov to discuss her work on the politics of Park Service heritage trails. And I'm happy to tell you that Professor Baraklov's book, Charros, a Mexican Cowboys are remapping race and American identity is available to borrow now at your local library, whether you're in New Haven or through interlibrary loan elsewhere in Connecticut. Now, please take it away, Professor Jacobson. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, let me start with a few thank yous. Thanks. Um, this partnership with the New Haven Free Public Library has been tremendously important for us over the years, and we're so happy to continue it. We're eager to be back in brick and mortar someday soon, but we do what we can by Zoom. Uh, so thanks for our partners there, Emmett McMillan, who you just met, uh, Seth Godfrey, Marion Huggins, Luis chavez Bramel, Delaney Kelly, Isaac Shubb, and Rory Mortarana. My thanks to my colleague Karen Rothman in uh, Public Humanities, who does so much for this program and for Public Humanities in general, and our associate Jake Gagne, um, who's working the technical end of this webinar and who also does so much for the Public Humanities. One program note, uh, our next program will be at our regular Tuesday evening time. It'll be Tuesday, March 29th at seven o'clock. We will welcome Josh Glick, who's currently a fellow at MIT uh, in communications and media studies. Uh, and he'll be talking about democracy in the age of disinformation and deep fakes. Uh, and it's hard to imagine a more timely or important conversation to be having uh, right now. But today, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Laura Baraklov. Uh, Professor Baraklov took her PhD at the University of Southern California. She currently teaches in the American Studies program at Yale, where she focuses on questions of land, memory, identity, and inequality in the United States. Much of Professor Baraklov's research is focused on the US West, how colonialism, racism, sexism, and class inequality are produced and challenged through the cultural politics of land use. She's especially interested in the tension between the rural and the urban as a constitutive dimension of this process. Her first book, Making the San Fernando Valley, Rural Landscapes, Urban Development, and White Privilege, shows how the intentional production of rural landscapes within Los Angeles since 1900 has been a vehicle for constructing settler colonialism and whiteness itself. Her second book, which you just got a glimpse of, Charos, how Mexican cowboys are remapping race and American identity examines how Mexican Americans in a range of Southwestern cities have used the figure of the Charo for social justice, cultural citizenship, and placemaking initiatives. The second strand of Professor Baraklov's work seeks to make the insights of radical geography and ethnic studies accessible and useful to public audiences. She's the co-author of A People's Guide to Los Angeles, an alternative tourist guidebook that highlights sites of racial, gender, sexual, labor, and environmental struggle in LA's vernacular landscapes. She co-edits the People's Guidebook series uh, with the Un University of California Press. Guidebooks are available or soon forthcoming for New York City, the San Francisco Bay Area, Boston, New Orleans, Orange County, Richmond, and others. She's published in uh, popular outlets, including the Los Angeles Times, Atlantic City Lab, and Pacific Standard. And she leads community workshops on social history and critical geography across the United States. Dr. Baraklov's current research examines how native communities and communities of color have used the National Historic Trail System, a public history program established by the US Congress in 1978 to disrupt white settler narratives of American history and to tell their own stories. This is what we will be hearing about today. And with that, welcome, Professor Baraklov. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I know that you have a, a brief presentation prepared for us, but first I wondered if you could just talk, talk a little bit about how you got into this current project on the heritage trails and heritage sites. Maybe give us a preview of, of where you are and your thinking about um, heritage as a kind of democratic and in some instances, anti-democratic cultural form. Uh, what are you finding? Sure. Um, so I, I have often thought as I've been, so the, the project that I'm working on is this um, study of the National Historic Trail System, which as you just mentioned, was created by Congress in 78. And the idea of the program is to commemorate 
um, the long distance paths of travel that have made the United States what it is. Um, so how have these long distance movements contributed to the making of the United States as a nation? Um, and when I, I, in some ways, I think that I was, I've been preparing to write this book my whole life. Um, I, I grew up, as I detailed in my first book, riding horses, hiking. I, I grew up in the middle of Los Angeles, but was surrounded by opportunities to move across and through natural landscapes. And so um, I can't remember actually how I first learned about the National Historic Trail System, but once I did, I felt like this is, this is it. This is what I've been trying to understand. And I think um, when I first started studying it, I, I expected to find that the trails commemorated through this heritage program would be only glorifying American history. And it is true that the, the first trails, that there were four trails that were um, included in the first 1978 enabling legislation, um, which included the Oregon Trail, the Lewis and Clark Trail, um, and two others. Actually, I should know this, but I don't remember which, but there were four, and they were all you know, what you might expect in sort of mainstream uh, whitewashed versions of American history. But what I quickly found, which I did not expect to find, was that almost from day one, indigenous communities and communities of color have seized upon this national historic trail system and have really worked within it to tell their own stories, as you mentioned, and also to use the act of storytelling to make real changes in the world. So the most powerful example that I can share with you now um, is the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. So um, that trail was created in 1978. There are all these road markers that you can see if you drive through Montana, North Dakota, and all the way across to Washington State. Um, but it just so happened that during the celebration of the, US, the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial between 2003 and 2006, there was a, a native man, Gerald Baker, who was superintendent of the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. And he made it his mission that they were going to transform the way we talk about Lewis and Clark. And that is an, it's an incredible story on his own, right? But 40 plus individual sovereign uh, tribal nations became involved. They, they collected oral histories, which are now available in a digital repository. And nowadays they're using those um, oral histories and memories of the Lewis and Clark expedition and all of its impacts on native communities across the country to actually create new curricular units mm. that are offered in seven states across the Pacific Northwest and upper Midwest, because those states have created mandates um, to teach native history in public schools. But what they found was that um, many school teachers were not actually prepared to teach those histories. So crazily enough, the Lewis and Clark Trail has been, I would say, the leading vehicle for teaching K-12 teachers how to better teach Native histories in the Pacific Northwest and Upper Midwest. And that's the kind of thing I just never expected to find. And it challenges the way that heritage is often marked and remembered. That's so interesting. So 1978 misses the boat by two years, but did all of this come out of the nation's bicentennial in 1976? It sounds well, like it. It was related to that, but it actually dates a little bit earlier. So the legislation gets passed, the first legislation gets passed in 1968, which was just a general, and it's Lyndon Johnson, Great Society, Get Americans Back Out, Outdoors, um, a lot of concern about what's happening in cities in the late, in American cities in the late 1960s. Um, but that first legislation in 1968 did not make any distinction between national trails. So it's in that moment that the Appalachian Trail and mm. the Pacific Crest Trail become national trails with federal protection. Before that, they had been run by um, mostly private and volunteer um, organizations. So there's this big push in 1968 to create national trails. And then in 1978, they get more specific and create three categories, which are national scenic trails, which includes the Appalachian Pacific Crest and some others, national historic trails, and national, and then more local recreation trails. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's when the category of historic trails gets created. Great, great. Okay, good. Well, that gives us an orientation. And now I'm going to throw the mic to you and uh, you can talk as much as you want. Great. great. So um, what I want to share with you all today is actually a, a more narrow slice of this larger project that I'm doing on the National Historic Trails. And specifically, I want to share with you a program that's been going since about 2000, uh, which is called Trails and Rails. And it's a partnership between Amtrak and the National Park Service. Um, and th the idea is that they train volunteer docents to get on board the trains and ride them on the long distance passenger routes and to deliver 
interpretive programs about what passengers are seeing outside their train windows. Um, so this, this program, um, usually it's about 20 different Amtrak long distance passenger routes, um, and it's been halted by COVID. So this no longer happens, but it was happening up until the summer of 2019. And the routes are all across the country. Um, and so they're usually on the, the long distance routes that are where, where passengers would be um, spending the night um, or maybe traveling for three, four, five days to get um, uh, long distances. Um, these are interpretive programs that are usually offered in the observation car of, of the trains, or it's sometimes called the sightseeing car. These have bigger, wider, more comfortable seats that rotate. They, the seats usually face out um, into the passing landscape, and those cars on the train have big picture windows. Um, and so the idea is that you are visually consuming the landscape as you pass through it, but you're also being told by one of these volunteer guides how to interpret the histories of what you're seeing there. Often the guides bring with them props, um, either sort of material cultural objects like um, maps or um, like beaver pelts, for example, they often bring animal skins and other kinds of things. They also bring laminated copies of primary documents like historic copies of treaties or um, land sales, et cetera. Um, so the, the thing that interests, there's many things that interest me about this. And with the 20 different routes passing all throughout the United States, each of them has a different theme that is connected to the national park that they're passing through or the national trail that they're passing through. Um, so some of, you know, like the, the line that, that passes, um, well, many of the lines that travel to and from New Orleans focus on Black musical culture, the jazz and the blues. Um, there is a line that travels between Selma and Montgomery, Alabama, that, that um, where that Trails and Rails program focuses on the Black freedom movement. Um, my, so there's lots to think about and look at here. The section of it that I'm looking at is the ways that the, the different Trails and Rails programs, especially in the United States West, uh, and how they represent Native American history or don't. Um, and I'm trying to understand those programs that, that do focus or, or sometimes erase Native American histories in the West in the context of a very, very long history through which the railroads, the national parks, and photography, landscape photography as ways of seeing worked together to dispossess and displace indigenous people from their lands to move white settlers onto the lands and then to create the circulations of people, of commodities, of ideas that are so central to the capitalist economy. Um, and so that is that is my focus. Um, and you know, I'll I'll be curious to hear as we get into the discussion how many of you here have ridden an Amtrak train long distance, um, whether you've experienced one of these trails and rails programs, especially before they were um, paused in, in beginning in 2020, um, or even how many of you on the call might consider yourself a train buff or a train lover. Because part of what I'm interested here is the bigger question of how, how do we experience history and landscape differently when we are moving? rather than in a stationary way. So for how might we learn American history differently through movement compared to, for example, going to a museum and, and seeing um, and experiencing things in a much more stationary and contained way. So what is it about movement, particularly on trains, that might um, open up new ways of learning about history, geography, um, and democracy, but also close some things down too. So I'm, I'm, those are some of the big questions that I'm that I'm interested in thinking about myself and also hearing from you, your thoughts about that. So I want to just um, lay out a little bit about this really uh, nasty and violent history through which the railroads and the national parks have worked together to uh, displace Native people from their homelands and facilitate westward expansion and US settler colonialism. Um, and so this is a, a long history dating to, well, I guess it depends on your perspective, but it dates to about the 1860s. Um, and then, so I'll lay out some of that history and then I wanna ask us to think about the ways that the Trails and Rails program might be continuing that legacy into the present. So some of you may know that the railroads um, are the perhaps the largest beneficiary of American land redistribution schemes. Um, the U.S. Pacific Railway Act of 1864 stipulated that for every mile of track that the transcontinentals built across the continent, they would receive 12,800 acres of land 
for every mile and any coal or iron deposits within that land where their right to mine those supplies and sell them. Um, the land was given in a checkerboard pattern, sort of alternating and extending 10 miles in each direction from the railway line itself. Um, and the reason that Congress granted those lands to the transcontinentals was to incentivize them to actually do it by giving them the ability to divide and sell that land as parcels of private property to settlers. Um, and then those settlers would then become the markets for the goods and commodities that were moving along these tracks that had been newly created. So the, the land grants were meant to encourage white settlement, create new markets, and also um, through the sale of the land, finance the next round of railroad construction. So as you might have sort of tallied up in your head, the amount of land given to the railroads in the 1860s in particular was tremendous. Historian Richard White has said that these land grants, grants were the equivalent of small countries. Um, in total, the US government granted, let me see if I can even read this correctly, 131,230,358 acres of land to the railroads. And if you concentrated that all together, it would be the third largest US state in terms of territory, second only to Alaska and Texas. Um, and that's just from the federal government. So state governments, uh, cities and towns often contributed additional land. Because they were such large landowners, the railroads also became extremely powerful in local and state as well as federal politics. So all of this is happening in the 1860s, which some of you may know is also at the absolute height of US warfare on indigenous peoples, especially in the Great Plains region. Um, so at this time that there were active ongoing battles against the Dakota, the Lakota, the Nez Perce, the Shoshone, the Kickapoo, and many other nations who had not ceded their land and were actively resisting government efforts to exterminate them, starve them out, or move them onto reservations at exactly this moment. So the land grants made to the railroads occurred at this moment and in this context, and they involved the seizure and transfer of land that was still very much inhabited, used, steward, and loved by indigenous nations. And in fact, um, the, the grants, the fact that the grants, the fact that the land that was then included in the grants was not yet ceded by indigenous nations was actually seen as an advantage by the government because that meant it was not in the public domain yet. Um, so it could not be claimed by individual settlers. And in fact, the land grants could be and often were written into the treaties that the US government made with or more accurately forced upon sovereign indigenous nations. And I'll just give you one example here, which is the Kickapoo Treaty of 1862. Uh, Senator Samuel Pomeroy of Kansas wrote a clause into that treaty with the Kickapoo which would allow for the sale of any surplus Kickapoo lands, so those that were uh, left over after the land had been divided among individual tribal members, any land left over after that process was transferred to the Atchison and Pikes Peak Railroad, which he owned and controlled. So Pomeroy uh, had that clause written into the treaty, and then he steered the treaty successfully through Congress over the objections of the Kickapoo, uh, which were investigated but have not yet been resolved. So this is just one example out of many. There are other, so the land grants being a really powerful um, way in which the railroads actively contributed to the dispossession of indigenous peoples from their land. Um, but at the same time, the railroads participated in many other forms of what Manu Karuka calls railroad colonialism. For example, they, the railroads often hired people to go out and engage in the mass slaughter of the bison upon which indigenous peoples depended for subsistence in order to force them to settle on the reservations um, and also stop them from dynamiting the tracks or obstructing trains and some of the other things that they were doing to try to resist railroad colonialism. Um, the railroads also were major sponsors, the primary sponsors of the developing technology of landscape photography in the 1860s. So the railroads were the, the major employers of some of the nation's first landscape photographers who essentially were hired to go out and take pictures of trains moving through these vast natural landscapes, which had just been acquired or seized through war. Um, and there's a historian, Alessandra Link, who has documented the ways that the photographers were actively working to suppress the visual evidence that Native people were still in these landscapes. Um, and so there's um, some interesting history on that. So now let's bring the national parks um, into this story. So as the railroads gained access to this land 
and started to build tracks across lands which were um, newly dispossessed of native peoples, but still rural, remote from the perspective of, of folks on the East Coast and in the interior Midwest. Um, the railroads were really invested quite literally in, in bringing people on their trains out into these lands. Um, and so it is for this reason that the railroads became major, even aggressive advocates for the creation of a, a national park system. Um, the trains had a near monopoly on transportation access to these areas, and they were also the major landowners, which gave them a near monopoly on the development of hotels and other kinds of concessions. So it's just a couple examples. The CEOs for the Northern Pacific Railroad were major sponsors of the creation of Yellowstone, I'm sorry, of Yosemite in the early 1860s and then Yellowstone in 1872. They actually wrote sections of the enabling legislation and worked to get it introduced to Congress. Um, similarly, the, the CEOs for Great Northern Railroad were avid supporters of Glacier National Park, which was created by Congress in 1910 on the lands of the Blackfeet. And the Blackfoot Reservation is immediately to the east of Glacier National Park. Um, they directly border each other. Great Northern, um, unlike other railroads that tried to pretend Native people were no longer there, Great Northern took a different approach, um, which was to actively promote the continuing presence of Blackfoot people, but then said to tourists that this is your chance to see, quote, specimens of a great race soon to disappear. So they put Native American art in their train cars, they paid Blackfeet and other Native people to greet tourists at the train stations and to set up encampments um, at Glacier National Park that tourists could visit and tour again with the idea that better see them now because they're, they're disappearing, they're about to go extinct. Train service to the American National Parks peaked in the 1920s. The Union Pacific created lines to Zion National Park, Bryce Canyon, and the northern edge of the Grand Canyon. The Southern Pacific line had a, a connection to Yosemite. The Santa Fe built a branch line to the southern rim of the Grand Canyon and built the luxurious El Tovar Hotel there. Um, and in the Pacific Northwest, the Great Northern launched its line called the Empire Builder, uh, interesting name choice, which travels between Chicago and Seattle and Portland um, starting in 1929. And to this day, that remains the most popular long distance train route in the United States on board the Empire Builder. Um, passenger train service began to decline though during the 1930s in the middle of the depression. And then as the private automobile kind of became the mode of travel for more and more American people, um, at, particularly with the construction of the interstate highways in the 1950s, people stopped using the trains as their ways to access the national parks. So regular passenger service to most of the national parks ended by the 1960s. But what I would like to suggest to you now and bringing us back to the Trails and Rails program, I wanna suggest to you that the Trails and Rails program not only reinvigorates those historical relationships between the railroads and the national parks, but that Trails and Rails also extends these histories um, into the present, histories through which trains have moved tourists and settlers across indigenous homelands, while simultaneously erasing any signs of Native American history, as well as ongoing indigenous presence. And also imagine allowing travelers, especially white settler travelers like myself, to imagine that we have a righteous justified claim to occupy those lands in the present. So I'll just say a few more things about how and why Trails and Rails was created um, and what it sort of looks and feels like to experience Trails and Rails. And I'll show you a short um, video that may give you a better sense of that. So the story of how and why Trails and Rails was created, um, there's sort of a lore around it that a person named Jim Masolka, who was then Chief of Interpretation and Education at the Jean Lafitte National Historic Park in New Orleans, um, he, the, the story goes that he had a ranch in Houston and, or east of Houston, and he would travel on the Sunset Limited line from New Orleans to Houston on his days off. And on the train, he would sort of informally share stories with other passengers about what they were seeing. One day um, in the late mid to late 90s, there was an Amtrak marketing official who heard what Masolka was doing and said, hey, we should create a formal program, which they did. Um, and so the program sort of started at a local level on the New Orleans to Houston, Houston line, but then expanded nationally. Um, but it's also important to put this in the context of what was going on with Amtrak, what continues to go on with Amtrak. Um, Amtrak is a, a constantly financially, uh, constantly precarious company. Um, many, many times Amtrak has threatened to cut its long distance routes 
uh, passenger routes. It says that Congress doesn't give the company adequate subsidies, especially in comparison with airports and airlines and highways. And they also point to the government subsidies that federal governments give for train service in Europe and Japan. The US is, falls very far short on that. Um, and in fact, in the first decade of the 21st century, Amtrak's long distance passenger routes lost about a half billion dollars per year. So if you've ridden Amtrak trains and have noticed uneven service quality, you know, the joke is that Amtrak trains are all, often hours late. Um, the trains themselves are often old and in need of repair, et cetera. Um, so there's a, a structural financial problem embedded in Amtrak. But as one response to that, in the early 2000s, Amtrak tried to create all of these growth strategies to increase ridership, improve service, and cut their costs, um, and especially competing with other transportation modes. So this is when they added the high-speed Acela service here in the Northeast. Um, and they also began trying to create a, a greater sense of place and region through some of their routes. So they started serving gumbo and crawfish, crawfish etouffee on, on this crescent line between New York and New Orleans. They made locally produced wines available for sale um, on routes that were moving through California wine country. And um, on the Adirondack line through the Hudson Valley, they added a special dome car, which has a, a domed um, plastic window to see through for leaf peeping for fall tourists. So the creation of the Trails and Rails program in 2000 occurred in that wider context of Amtrak's efforts to create a value added service that promises to boost ridership, cut losses for the company, um, and it's provided by volunteers, so it costs the company virtually nothing. So I'm gonna share with you some um, slides now that may give you a sense of what this looks like. The goals of the program that were, again, was created in the year 2000 uh, were threefold. Um, to foster appreciation of a selected region's natural and cultural heritage, to promote the national parks, and to provide a value added service that would increase train ridership and therefore offset Amtrak's ongoing financial losses. And additionally, I'll say that among the National Park Service guides and superintendents that I've spoken with, for them, there's an additional layer of this, which is to cultivate a public that is more fully committed to protecting public lands at a time when those lands have been um, perpetually under attack, actually. Um, and so by the year 2015, uh, 22 distinct National Park Service units were offering these interpretive programs on board 19 different long distance train routes and more than 500 volunteers are involved. Um, the volunteer, so here's a map of um, what some of these routes look like. You can see that there's a lot of them um, crossing sort of the, the east coast of the United States, but there's also these longer distance transcontinental routes um, that traverse major sites of, um, Amer well, all of this is American history, right? The volunteers are recruited from local train museums, as well as volunteer match websites and train related public events. And most of the people who actually sign up to be these onboard interpreters are people we would consider train buffs, people who love trains, love riding trains, talking about trains, et cetera. And some of the people who coordinate volunteers say that it's actually really hard to find people who are not totally enamored with trains and who instead care about other aspects of American history. I want to now show you um, a video. Let's see, I'm going to give you a sense of, again, what this looks like. Um, and I'm going to show you two clips. This is from an Amtrak promotional video, which are always fun to look at how companies promote themselves. But I'd love for folks to think and reflect on the way that Amtrak is promoting this program in a general sense. And then I'm going to show you a clip of what the program on board the Empire Builder train route looks like. Um, and ask you to reflect to yourself about how Native American history is being represented there and specifically the role of the railroads. So just a moment, please, to set this up and then hopefully. All right, let me know, Matt, if you can't hear or the history of America's railroads and our national parks are inextricably linked. In the early days of our national parks, railroads provided the easiest and sometimes only means of access to their natural wonders. That link continues today with Trails and Rails, a partnership between the National Park Service and Amtrak 
that brings the National Park experience on board for the benefit and enjoyment of Amtrak passengers. Riding the train has always been about more than getting from point A to point B. And the Trails and Rails program is a great example of how special a train trip can be. This is no 30,000 foot view of the world. You get up close and personal with the natural and cultural heritage of the places just outside your train window. On Amtrak routes around the country, Trails and Rails guides give seasonal talks about places of interest along the journey, answering questions and engaging you with the stories behind the landscapes. These volunteers are passionate about the subjects they share and often bring along items to enhance the story. Maps, artifacts like furs and pottery, some even dress the part in historical costumes. Each Trails and Rails program is unique, but they are all carefully designed to give passengers a better understanding of our public lands and our responsibility to preserve their special natural and cultural resources. We're pleased to offer a glimpse of some of the exciting and educational Trails and Rails programs from across the country. Okay, and now I'm going to show you the clip about the Empire Builder. Builder. To our south is Fort Buford, one of the many military posts established for the protection of overland and river routes to the west. This area is most importantly known as the place where Sioux Chief Sitting Bull surrendered in 1881. There were many battles between the Sioux people and the United States military, but after the Battle of Little Bighorn, the Sioux retreated to Canada. Facing starvation, they eventually came back and agreed to make peace by settling on the reservation. On the southern horizon, you'll see the Bear Paw Mountains, where the Nez Perce Indians surrendered to U.S. Army forces in 1877. Following the breakout of war in Idaho, nearly 800 Nez Perce spent a long and arduous summer fleeing U.S. Army troops, first toward Crow allies, and then toward refuge in Canada. Forty miles short of the Canadian border and following a five-day battle in siege, the Nez Perce ceased fighting at Bear Paw on October 5th. Today, the Bear Paw battle site is a part of the Nez Perce National Historical Park and features a walking trail where you can learn more about this historic battle. Okay, there's more, but I will pause it there. Matt, I'm curious what you think about when you see. <laughs> it's, it's one of those documents, both of them are, that it's like it was dreamed up in an American studies laboratory because, because so many of the themes of what we study are so deeply embedded. So I was struck that in the first one is all about absence. I mean, it's, it's a totally depopulated landscape and the only way that the, the native nations make an appearance is as relics, literally as relics, as the, you know, the collection of arrowheads and the pottery or whatever. Um, so it's doing, the empire builder is doing the work of ongoing empire of just kind of naturalizing the, the stewardship of the landscape as, as a kind of prior and racialized right. The second one is going the other route. It's not about absence, but it's all about surrender. There's not a single other thing about, about native nations in there except their surrender. And even it seemed to me the the narrative that's on offer um, after Little Bighorn is a kind of cautionary tale about about Native nations kind of slipping away from the stewardship of their white overseers and needing to come back. Yeah, yeah. The language you're right. It's about surrender. It's about starvation. It's about fleeing. Right. They're always losing. They're always suffering. And then. And then we don't know what happens, right? Um, there's a brief reference to the Dakota settling on their reservation, um, but then then we're left with nothing after that too, right? Including the fact that the train would actually be passing very close by. Some of these reservations and tribal communities where people are still very much alive, thriving, supporting their families and their communities. So there's also no present day mention of native communities. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that I thought about too, as I, so back in July of 2019, I, I wanted to um, experience what, what it's actually like to go through a Trails and Rails program. Because one of the other things I notice about this video, to me, this is like no Amtrak experience that I've ever had. Does, is that the way you have experienced Amtrak, this sort of quiet train? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, my experience of Amtrak, it's been a while, but my experience of Amtrak I mean, it's been a while except for the, the Eastern seaboard, but cross country, it's been decades since I've done that. But my memory of it is first, the train breaks down all the time. Mm 
all the time all the time yeah and and it's incredibly noisy and you're getting jostled around and i mean there it could be restful in the sense that you're being rocked but it's um it that was not my experience yeah yeah and so that's that's exactly right so when i look at this promotional video now it doesn't match at all what i experienced when i rode one of these lines and my intention was actually to ride many of them but um but then covid sort of has halted the program but i rode the coast starlight uh, which is the train that travels along the California coastline. Um, and the line itself runs from San Diego to Seattle, but the Trails and Rails program um, is between uh, uh, San Jose and Santa Barbara. So it's about a three hour stretch um, and it's it's beautiful, right? Because you're moving along the coast. Um, I happen to be traveling on a glorious July day. It was just beautiful. But th that line is also the only way to access Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is otherwise closed to the public. So literally riding on Amtrak is the only way to move across that beautiful section of the coastline. Um, and what I observed there, is, and what I'm thinking about a lot, is the way that the Trails and Rails program, um, perhaps unlike other ways of learning about history, um, is reaching the people that I call accidental tourists. So the people who are riding Amtrak are riding Amtrak to get from one place to another. Um, many of the people who are riding these long distance routes are afraid of flying, um, or they are people who are, um, for, there are larger numbers of undocumented immigrants and because the, the security procedures for trains are relatively minimal. So in that way, train ridership is actually, a, I would say, a more democratic mm -hmm. or lower barriers to entry than, let's say, airplane travel. Um, but what this means is that you have a lot of people riding on these trains who are doing it for practical or personal reasons. They are not there to learn about history. Mm -hmm. um, and what I observed when I was riding the train is that, you know, for people who are maybe have reserved a coach seat for three days of travel, they don't even have a sleeper car. Um, they're, they're getting up and moving around the train a lot because they're bored, they're stiff, they don't like the person they're sitting next to, they're not there to learn about history. Um, but they end up in this observation car because it is, it is the best place on the train to be. The seats are wider, they rotate, they're more comfortable. Um, and so there's a lot of people who are camped out there for hours, drinking a lot of alcohol, <laughs> they're sleeping, um, and they're all like there's people jostling each other to try to get one of these coveted seats. So that's the context in which this historical program is being given. And we don't see any of that um, mm -hmm. in this very clean and shiny video that is um, produced through the partnership. But the other thing I wanna say is that, so, so also what that means is that I think the designers of the program have been very thoughtful and strategic. Actually, they have designed a narrative or an interpretive program that is episodic and place-based. So the guides are trained to know which landmark is coming up, which building, which interesting rock formation, et cetera, um, and to use that to anchor a particular history that they want to that they want to share. And that's useful for a variety of reasons. One is that if the train gets delayed for several hours or 20 minutes, it doesn't interrupt their flow, right? So they can, or if the train has to speed up or slow down, they can pick which histories and which landmarks they're going to talk about. So it's a strategic kind of program. It also means that they're not relying on people to be there with them, audience members to be there with them for hours listening to something that builds on each other, right? So literally there are many people walking through the observation car and the guides might be talking about such and such um, military base, you know, thing. And somebody will be walking by trying to squeeze around them to get to the cafe car and be like, hey, is the cafe car this way? And the guide has to stop what they're doing and say, yeah, three cars down, right? So it's this very um, loose and informal interpretive structure that again is um, episodic and place-based in reference to particular landmarks out the window. And I think that works um, given the, the context of the train. What it doesn't work very well for is building any kind of nuanced analysis of why certain histories have unfolded the way that they do. Mm -hmm. And what I observed is, you know, when I saw this promotional video, I was stunned that there was that extensive of a history of Native people. I don't think, I haven't ridden the Empire Builder, um, so I don't know, but I will tell you that on the, the Coast Starlight, there was zero mention. Well, there was almost zero mention of Native peoples. Um, and my guess, my working hypothesis that I hope to test on later field work is that Native history is like the first thing to go, especially when you have mostly elderly people 
mostly mm. white men who are retired, who love trains, um, that that is one of the first things that starts to drop out of the program. So I spoke with one of the people in California who had developed the script there. And she explained to me that they do give the guides a script, um, but they tell the guides that they can pick whatever they want from that script to talk about according to their own personal interests and expertise. And she said they have to do that because these are volunteers who are right. giving up their weekends. They're doing it for free, you know, and so they can't force these people to talk about things that they don't know about or don't care about. But again, right. Native history was the first thing to drop out. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, I'm curious about so many things. Well, one is, um, is this a form that can be redeemed? You yes. know, because I think, you know, history, history is one of the best tools that we have at our disposal in trying to really grapple with the problem of democracy. Um, so one wants to applaud any effort like this. On the other hand, it's very easy to get very cynical very quickly when you see kind of what can happen under this kind of an aegis. But I'm just curious, as you've spent some time with this, it, is this is this a form with, with the railroads involved and with the state involved, is it conceivable that good things can happen in this kind of a rubric? I absolutely think so. Um, and actually, the reason why I think it's redeemable is because maybe ironically, that sort of place-based way of narrating history aligns so beautifully with indigenous ways of knowing history in place, which where stories are known and referenced um, in relationship to specific places that have histories and those histories are shared through storytelling with other members of the community and with outsiders. So place-based storytelling is at the core of indigenous identity and it's a way in which indigenous perspectives on American history have been held onto and preserved and passed on to generations. So I actually think there's a very beautiful correspondence between what Trails and Rails is already doing um, and, and indigenous ways of knowing history and the landscape. What I think would need to happen is they would need to start recruiting in different places. Right. Um, so rather than going to the train museum, um, the local train museum, I think that they would need to start working with um, uh, tribal historic preservation officers, for example, they would need to train young people and they need to be willing to change the script, right? They would need to write a new script and be willing to um, entertain different ways of telling history. But I will also say, I think there's people on the train who are hungry for those alternative histories. Um, and maybe some of those people who are walking through um, and choosing not to stop would stop if they heard a story about something more related to their own community's experiences. Right, right. And it's related to my other question, which, and by the way, um, please um, feel free to post comments and questions either in the Q&A or the chat, and uh, we will monitor those. Um, my other question just had to do with the contemporary, you know, pretty horrible vibe of around the, the so-called culture wars, which is a misnomer because it's really an assault of, of upon one side by the other. It's not really a culture war. It's just an all out attack. But in this climate where virtually everything is politicized, um, how much pushback do they get on their interpretations? How much, I mean, how harrowing is it to be a guide in one of these settings? Um, how volatile is this, this situation where you get a kind of, you get this public of chance comers who happen to be there listening to what might be, you know, quite explosive versions of a history that people either think they know or that they don't know at all, but don't want to know. I mean, that's a really, that's a tough question. I think, you know, my own experience was I didn't hear a single story that I thought was very controversial. <laughs> you know, I think um, the guides tell these stories in ways that are pretty depoliticized. And it's hard to imagine people, at least in the experience that I had, um, it was hard to, to imagine anyone becoming terribly upset by what they're hearing. But I also think there's something about place-based histories that, um, can sometimes allow us to work through or past that because maybe maybe less so on a train because people riding a train are by definition moving through it. They may not have those attachments, um, but people in general love place. They love knowing more about places. And so sometimes I think if we can tell more complicated histories of a place rather than an identity category, right? That sometimes that allows us a new way in because people, you know, I teach in geography and we were just talking in my class yesterday, 
humans by definition feel belonging when we know more about the places that we inhabit. So if we can cultivate a, a more complicated um, knowledge of a place that is about loving the place, you know, and loving it by knowing more about it, I think that that maybe I'm just being overly optimistic here, but I do think that sometimes place based histories allow us to reach people when telling history in other ways may not. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So what is your outlook for the future of this program? And actually, I mean, I also want to circle back to that gentleman who you mentioned at the outset, who has kind of single-handedly revamped one piece of the story. I would love to hear more about that figure. But I'm just curious, kind of, I mean, obviously, we have to get to the other side of COVID, whatever that means for this program to continue. But but what's, what's your outlook in general for this program? And how much hope do you hold out that it, it can do the kind of important place-based work that you're talking about? Um, I think the program will continue. I think it'll come back after COVID sort of winds down um, because there is, one thing I didn't mention is that Texas A&M University actually has educational and administrative support for the program. So they put their master's students to work, um, you know, studying the program, coordinating it. And there's some real education around historical interpretation that's happening there. So there's institutional buy-in to this. Um, I am not that hopeful that the scripts are going to change, um, that they're going to start offering more critical narratives of American history. I don't, I don't really see any possibility of that, which is sort of striking because um, the National Historic Trails have done a lot of this work to offer more critical, complex histories. And many of the National Park units have too. And um, you know, that some of us may remember that in the days after Trump's inauguration, the National Park Service sort of took over a rogue Twitter account and were protesting some of Trump's early actions to cut public lands. Um, and so th there are a number of people working in the Park Service who are actually really, really interested in developing more critical, anti-racist, anti-colonial kinds of histories. I guess I am not seeing that interest and energy that's happening within the National Park Service on the trains. There's a disconnect that has happened there. And I would be interested in exploring yeah. that. There's a flip side of this that our, our colleague Sally Promi brings up, which is um, the two videos that we saw actually are heavily political by through omission and through their kind of framing and interpretation. So, it, I mean, one question is like, you know, watered down history is one thing, but it, it can be watered down in a way that, um, bleaches it of certain meanings in a way that it, it actually is doing a new kind of harm. Yes. And, and that's another concern, I suppose. Absolutely. Abs and I think that's right. Thank you, Sally, for pointing that out. And I, I sort of alluded to this, but I was so surprised to see any mention of it in the video because my own experience in California, Native people were mentioned exactly once, and this is how they were mentioned. Um, the guy, we were passing by Halama Beach, which is now like a public campground and public beach. Um, on the California coast and the National Park Service interpreters asked everybody in the car, they say, Halama, that's a Spanish sounding word, isn't it? Are there any Spanish speakers on the on the train? And there were a lot of Spanish speakers on the train. And, and the guide said to the woman sitting next to him, what does Halama mean in Spanish? And she said, that's not a word in Spanish. And he, he said, exactly. So, and what he said, the guide was that Halama is the name that the Spanish colonists gave to a place called Halam by the Chumash uh, native peoples. And so Halam was the name of the Chumash village, which, and Halam, if I understand correctly, means bundle or gathering. And it was a gathering place for people from the surrounding Chumash villages who would come there and gather. Um, and so that is that was the only mention that we got of native peoples was the mangled Spanish place name of an indigenous village. But I learned that history about what Halam means and what it had meant to the Chumash by my own independent research. The guides did not mention any of that. And so it is very much about erasure, silencing, um, as well as these much more actually explicitly negative portrayals that we heard on the Empire Builder. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that kind of ideological work is so powerful and so important that, I mean, I. I when I was in grad school in the 80s, um, it was during um, the kind of Reaganite um, interventions in Central America, and there was a, a lot of political activism around that. There was a group called um, US Out of Central America. And at the time, one of my favorite postcards, it said US Out of North America. Uh -huh. And at the time, it was a joke, but Indigenous Studies has really kind of brought that idea to the forefront in that 
that colonization is an ongoing process. It's not just safely fossilized in some distant past, but it's it has to be reproduced and recreated at every moment. And, and you know, things like Hollywood Westerns, but also things like Trails and Rails programs are, are the cultural stuff that, that does that work of kind of naturalizing empire and making it seem like it's safely fossilized in the, in the, in the past. And I would love to hear your reflections on that. And, and again, this fellow who you mentioned at the outset, who seems like he's, he's talking back to that tradition in a really important way. He's incredible. And maybe you know, he's retired now, Gerard Baker. Um, and he, maybe this would be a project to bring him out of <laughs> retirement. But uh, yeah, he was the superintendent on the trail. And um, the way he tells that story is that, you know, he had the responsibility of coordinating tribal involvement in how the Lewis and Clark bicentennial would be um, observed. And he, you know, I, I met him, I went to a, actually a symposium called Railroads in Native America, which was held in Omaha, um, and it was sponsored by the Union Pacific Museum. So just to come back to your earlier point that there is a way in which that there is a, a reckoning, I think, that is happening now with, with the violence of um, Native American history or the violence toward Native American people in US history, but also the ongoing presence and these critical questions about how we still occupy Native mm -hmm. lands that were not ceded. They have not been given up, you know, and a lot of there's still treaties that are could be actively and are actively contested. So Baker, um, I met at this symposium, which I think that symposium railroads in Native America represents some early efforts by the railroad industry or at least the museums that are involved with the railroad industry to reckon with some of these histories. And Baker talked at that, you know, at that symposium, and he's written about this too, um, about how at first part of his work was simply changing the language from a celebration of the bicentennial to a commemoration. Um, and then he talks about how he spent, he, he pounded the pavement, except it's not pavement, of visiting 40 plus tribal nations um, and trying to secure their involvement in this commemoration. And, um, you know, he talks pretty candidly about how other Native people called him a sellout um, for working for the National Park Service. And, you know, they, it took him a lot of time to build that trust. The way that he gained their trust was by telling them, you can tell your story any way you want, and I'm not going to censor you. And he set up what was called the Tent of Many Voices during the Bicentennial, and it actually traveled. And they invited Indigenous speakers to come into this tent, to have a microphone, and to share their memories and their experiences. And there was no censorship. They got to tell their stories the way that they wanted to. And I think that is the lesson that we would need to redeem a program like Trails and Rails is if we're going to bring indigenous voices into the story, which is essential, we have to give folks autonomy and power to tell their stories the way that they want to, including in ways that may make listeners uncomfortable. Um, whether Amtrak is willing to um, go along with that, I, I'm not hopeful, but I think that's what would be required. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's a question from the audience that actually matches up with something I was thinking myself. Um, if the current administration will help to rebuild passenger rail service, how could you lobby to include a more vibrant trails and rails program? Um, and then secondarily, would Yale want to oversee the definition of such a program? Um, and I was thinking about that myself, not, not Yale specifically, but some kind of, of um, federation of public humanities and public history programs that might get you know, maybe give students credit for becoming some of the volunteers and maybe trying to exert some influence on the, the public narratives that yeah. way. Is there room for that, do you think? I think there is. You know, I mentioned the program at Texas A&M University. So far, to my knowledge, um, the students in that program, the master students, are not the ones getting on board the trains and actually delivering it. But in theory, actually, this is a volunteer program. So in theory, anybody can sign up. There's a relatively minimal training. It's like a weekend of training where you go usually to a train station's conference room and you learn about some basics of historical interpretation. You learn how to set up AV equipment. Um, you learn some basic safety procedures for um, being on a train. But in theory, anybody can do this. And so it could be a coordinated effort that would, in, that would bring students and others. We could do something sort of subversive and take over the program. Another idea that has been floated, which I think is really fascinating to think about too, is the development of podcasts or some sort of app that would you right. could download um, and listen to a, a whole diversity of voices about the different kinds of places that you're passing on the train, much oh. like they do in exhibits, right? Where you 
here's right. number 19, press number 19. And so, right. so like a sound design, a sound design to go with, with the trip. That would, all right, students, I hope you're listening. These are great <laughs> projects. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time. Last comment, this is from our friend E.C. Schroeder pointing out that uh, the Union Pacific Railroad is co-sponsoring a Railroads in Native America gathering um, conference in Ogden, Utah this spring. Um, it looks like you can Google it um, and find it at um, indian.utah.gov events uh, railroads. Um, I'm sure you can find that online, but that sounds very interesting as well and on point. That's um, the, the second version, actually. That, that, that's So the, the first version of that was in Omaha in 2019, and there was oh, so, much, okay. so much interest and enthusiasm that they agreed to do a second one, this time in Ogden. And I'll just say for anyone who may be interested, one, that was honestly one of the best conferences I've ever gone to because it wasn't just academics. There were artists, um, musicians that, that all, so it was a very culturally rich and diverse set of people who care about trains, but for different reasons. That's great. Well, Laura, thank you so much. Is there anything that we didn't get to that you wish that we had? We have, I can give you a minute to button this up if there's anything else you wanna bring in. I would be unbuttoning it because I feel, you know, I still would love to hear from people and anyone may email me or just, or talk with me at some point if you're around New Haven about what, what is it about trains that people love, you know, because people do still love trains. And I think that that is where there is so much possibility in some ways to sort right. of capitalize, eh, it's not the word I love, but capitalize on people's love for trains and for place um, to start exploring some of these histories. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been a great way to spend our midday. Thank you for taking the time. And I, I just love this project of yours. I'm eager to, to read more and hear more about it as, as you go. Thank you so much. Um, and again, I was sincere reaching out to students. If anyone's interested in pursuing some of these possibilities around either getting involved with the program as a volunteer or working on some of those sound designs, um, that would be a great public humanities project. Um, Remember that on March 29th, we'll be hosting our friend Josh Glick, who will be talking about democracy in the age of disinformation and deep fakes. Um, there's an intimidating prospect. Um, thank you all. Thanks so much. Thanks to you, Laura. Everyone take care. Have a great day. Be careful out there. It's beautiful, but it's still a pandemic. Keep your guard up. All right. Thank take you. care. Take care, everyone. Bye.